So I'll step aside. We have a uh, little video from the Point Zero Forum. This is another event run by Elevandi and MAS, run in Zurich every year. Uh, it's kind of like the Davos of Swiss, Switzerland, I suppose, where people get together and discuss some of the issues around availability of data, the crypto, et cetera. I think you'll like it. So thank you all very much, and I wish you a successful conference. A lot of investments in technology, uh, artificial intelligence. Can the regulatory community itself be successful in this high-tech world? Climate change is the existential central challenge of our times. This will be the increasing preoccupation of all of us. It's a cognitive revolution. It's an information revolution. Transactions uh, can take place now with tokenized securities. Hope you enjoyed that. Um, interesting enough, uh, lots of people talking there, but that's the point. I think we can all start to share our knowledge together and uh, collaborate and, and build partnerships, which is the only way we're going to be successful. I'm very excited about this next panel, particularly as I know two of the people personally, and I know how, uh, how high quality they are and the depth of knowledge they have. I'd like to introduce uh, Timothy Adams, who's the President and Chief Executive of the Institute of International Finance. Uh, he's going to run a panel on unlocking the climate transition, markets, data, and technology. Always a conundrum. It'll be interesting to hear the insights. Uh, please, Timothy. Great. Can you hear me? Great. Thank you, Anton, and thanks to everything that KPMG does. Thanks for coming here today. We've got an excellent lineup. Before I bring them on stage, let me just put this uh, challenge in context. What we're attempting to do between now and 2050 is the greatest, most profound engineering challenge in human history. Think about it. Over the course of the last 10,000 years, we have layered one series of energy solutions on top of another. Wood, coal, oil, uh, nuclear, renewables. Now we're attempting to replace the first three of those sources with energy sources that have net carbon emissions. And we're attempting to do that in 25 years. Think about it, thousands of years to get where we are today, and in 25 years, completely transform not only the way in which we get energy, but the way in which we conduct our businesses, where we live our lives, the industries, our households. It is the most profound change ever attempted. To do that, we need the public sector, we need the private sector, and we need a tremendous amount of financial resources. By some estimates, nine trillion a year, that's with a T, nine trillion a year, for every year for the next 25 years. How are we gonna get there? Today's uh, panel is going to discuss that. So if I could have our panelists on stage and I'll introduce you. Diana Guzman, Group Head ESG from Prudential. The Ming Chen. Chief Sustainability Officer for Ant International. Christoph Koning, Deputy State Secretary for, uh, from Switzerland for the Secretary for International Finance. And not uh, last but certainly not least, Jillian Tan, Assistant Manager Director and Chief Sustainability Officer for the uh, Monetary Authority of Singapore. Please have a seat. I don't think I've ever sat on a crate before or not in a long time. What do we, we're gonna do this in two waves, uh, and then we hope to have some time for the audience to log a few questions in, and I think there'll be some roaming mics, but to do that, I need to get started quickly. So let's start with our friends from the public sector, and we're gonna, first set of questions is on enabling a whole economy transition. So we're gonna start with the hometown hero here, the MAS, one of the most profound institutions, always at the frontier of innovation, no matter what they take on. Jillian, finance is a critical enabler of the net zero transition. Could you tell us about MAS's strategy uh, for the transition planning 
and the role of data and technology in that. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Tim. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, you know, I really liked what you said at the start, right? Setting transition in context. I think it's not just an engineering challenge, right? This is the largest, biggest economic, societal transformation that we're, we're going to do and try and do. And the reality is fossil fuels are really at the backbone of development, prosperity. They have been for decades. And um, they still very much dominate global energy and power production. But just some data, just so we can put our arms around this problem. Maybe I'll focus on Asian data as well, because I think you gave some really good global numbers. Um, the first data point, right? Asia accounts for half of the world's population and half of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so that's significant. We supply the world's um, steel and cement, hugely emitting you know, um, sectors. And yet, you know, with that big demand comes more because energy demand is just going to increase two and a half times, they say, until 2050. So that's the first data point. The second data point, 1.7 trillion US dollars, right? And that's the amount of climate and infrastructure investment that developing Asia is going to need per year up to 2030, 1.7 trillion. Third data point, one trillion dollars. And that's the gap that McKinsey has estimated for APEC, right, to get to net zero. And the final data point, which we don't talk about enough, but I'm just gonna say it, 110 billion dollars. And that's the global net cat losses, natural catastrophe losses, in just the first half of this year. And that way exceeded the, the, the 10 year average for this. So right. the issue of climate is here today. It's affecting financial institutions, the way they do business, the way they price risk, um, and, and it's major. And given that, it should be unsurprising that the expectations on financial institutions have gone up, right? From governments, from regulators, from shareholders, from asset owners, the works, right? And we know that the NGFS, for example, launched uh, earlier this year a stock take on transition planning uh, guidance and frameworks. So the momentum is there. It's captured the attention, the momentum is there. So you asked about MES's approach. Um, last month, we issued supervisory expectations on transition planning. We call it the transition planning guidance. It's a very detailed, actually it's three documents, because there's one for banks, asset managers and one for insurers. Yeah, Diana. <laughs> and you know, just some key takeaways for, because we know everyone's going to go read the document, right? Um, but just some key takeaways. I think the first was that it's about engagement, not divestment. So we make that very clear that engagement is the key lever for, for you know, stewardship and stakeholder engagement. The second theme that really comes up is the important role that sectoral pathways play. So the FIs have told us, hey, you know, the taxonomy is great, it's useful, but what we really need to steward our clients and get to transition are sectoral pathways, sector by sector, so that we can work client by client. So we need to do more work there. And finally, I think there is also explicit recognition, and this is important, that if financial institutions do well in supporting their clients through this process, they will likely see a short-term increase in their financed emissions. And the MES has been crystal clear on this, that's okay. Right? It's to be expected and that's okay, provided that the financial institution has a longer term transition plan with uh, climate positive outcomes and you know, it's part of that process. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up the sectorial piece because it is important. One of the key challenges in the sectorial approach is how do we certify those sectors are actually uh, on a trajectory so that our private sector firms can invest in a way in which we benefit, we're not accused of greenwashing because uh, the sectors or their transition plans simply aren't up to snuff. You know, how do we certify? And we'll come back to that. Let me go to the other end of the spectrum here, uh, to Switzerland, uh, and our other public sector guest. Uh, Christopher, how do you think about this from a, we heard about Asia, how do you see this from a whole economy perspective, and especially from your seat in Switzerland? Thank you very much, Tim, and also Gillian, for uh, introduction. Um, I, we certainly, on, Swi on the Swiss side, we see transition finance as an important pillar also of our financial market strategy. Um, adding to that, we had a popular vote, as uh, we have regularly in Switzerland, also on a climate act, uh, which actually introduced uh, this June a law 
requiring us also to find and supporting through financial institutions uh, measures to mitigate climate change. Um, on the Swiss side, we very much uh, are leading uh, the initiative through uh, the market-led approaches. We have not opted for binary taxonomies like other jurisdictions did. Also, uh, to reflect the challenges that transition uh, and transition financing is uh, handing out to us. In particular, with the transition financing is dif uh, different across regions, times, but also across institutions. Uh, in Switzerland, the challenge uh, for transitioning is certainly on transport, which makes up uh, a lot of energy, also energy uh, for housing and heating. Uh, on the contrary, agriculture, forestry and land use is not actually uh, uh, an issue for us, whereas in the Asian region, this may be much more of interest. So the challenge is actually having data and also uh, taxonomies and also just comparable uh, data that allow us actually to take into account different transition needs and phases. Um, getting back to the financial institutions, what we really foster uh, is transparency as such. Right. We see that uh, in the end, uh, pricing uh, CO2 and carbon emissions adequately would do actually the trick. However, this is very difficult to achieve. Whereas through disclosure practices, we really see that, uh, 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 that institutions are trying and pushing also the real economy in coming up with uh, credible transition plans. Thank you. Yeah, and you, you mentioned disclosure. One of the challenges, because we have different disclosure regimes globally, right, whether it's single or double materiality, depending on the SEC or the EU, and then the ISSB is certainly trying to bring some cohesion. The last count I had, especially on taxonomy regimes, is there's some two dozen green taxonomy regimes around the world. So what is green here may not be what is green in Stockholm, and we have to plow through that. Let's now turn to our friends from the private sector. Diana, the Prudential, you guys are a leader in this space. Your chair is on my board, so I know her well. What does the private sector need? You've got two public sector officials here. Let's tell them what we're looking for from them. What do we need from them? Thank you. Thank you, team, and thank you, everyone, for showing up to, to a talk today. Um, I think I'm going to sound like a parrot because what I just heard is music to our ears from the financial sector. Um, taxonomies, taxonomies, plans, how countries will transition at the sectorial level is very, very important for everything that was mentioned. We want to make sure that when we move money into those countries to help that transition, we're actually putting what impact, when we can be most impactful, when it can be catalytic. So it's very, very important. For us as Prudential, we are not only a life and health insurer, but we're also a long-term investor in those countries. We're married to those countries. The fact that those countries transition to net zero in a just and inclusive way is material business for us. So it's not only a responsibility, but it's also a viability of the long-term um, uh, insurable world. Right. So um, from the public sector, and here I'm talking about countries, but also f development finance institutions supported by public sector. So I'm going to encapsulate on those. So back to what Gillian said, taxonomy is at country level, as sector level, very important. I think the area that we're also seeing that probably is missing is the social piece in those taxonomies. Um, if we're talking about retiring coal power plants earlier, which is what we want to do, and MAS is a big advocate for that, and, and in transition finance is one of the key uh, elements. What is going to happen to the transition of those workers? Are they prepared to take on jobs in the green economy? What about energy security, access to energy for the average layman on the street? Let's not decouple the climate transition with the social transition. Social transition could be both the enabler on the hinder of the climate transition. We're seeing across many of the jurisdictions in the world, I'm not going to name them, but it is very important that we see these two together as good friends. So for us, advocate to finance a just and inclusive transition across Asia and Africa. The second point was also mentioned, which is data. Data that we can trust, that we can compare, standardization, uh, viability of the data. There's certain markets in which we operate that there's no data from MSCI. And 
we need to put a lot of effort in on engagement um, strategy, which is part, it's a big pillar of our strategy, by the way, back to what Lillian said. I'm going to speak to you in a second. But um, um, can we have data that we can use and trust and compare? And I think technology and AI has a massive role to play in that, and probably we, we can cover in the second round. But let's use those levers to actually make sure that we achieve to that. The last point is regarding financing, and I'm not going to get into technical terms here, but blended finance, that very innovative approach to, to combine different sources of capital to the risk investments in sustainability. Um, we are being an um, active actor investor using blended finance for a long time, but we found notice is that Blended finance is, 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 gets, gets very excited about the, the innovations and the one-offs and the things that work in very specific contexts, in very specific places that cannot be scaled up and replicated. If we're talking trillions here, and if we're really around the clock, I mean, really going against time here, we need to go to scale. So one of the things that we always tell development finance institutions is, A, what about pouring your money into things that are already working? on the ground, capacity on the ground. I'll give you an example very quickly. Guarantees mechanisms. These are basically instruments that help a company in Vietnam that wants to issue green bonds. They enhance it so the credit rating is higher and therefore it's, it's in line with our um, uh, risk return appetite, right, of low investors. We are avid consumers of guarantees. Our challenge is that size and, and antenna. It's, so if you really want to big the big money, we need to go to scale. And then things already work. Proving mechanisms. We are one of the first investors in the first solar uh, project in Vietnam through a guarantee mechanism. We're investing in infrastructure in Cambodia through a guarantee mechanism. Some of our peers might say, oh, emerging markets, not investable. They are. Their instruments are there. Um, so why don't we just make that bigger and more impactful? You, you raised three good issues. One about blended finance and the importance of the public sector helping to take off some of the risk. The Asia Development Bank has been very active in the region, especially in Indonesia. I think there's a, a great example for that institution and the MDBs generally. I know we've got the president of the World Bank here this week, and I know he's speaking on this issue too, is the quality of data, access to data. Is it very good? Nope. But it'll get better. We just have, need a bit, of a, a, a bit of a patience. And convergence. And convergence. Uh, so just, can I just jump in on data just on really in. quickly? I just wanted to say that, you know, uh, I absolutely agree with you. Last week, uh, the global CEO of one of the largest banks, I won't say which one, but it's American, um, said to some of us that less than 5% of their clients disclose scope 3 data. Right. So it's a real, real problem. And we need to do more. And if I can just sneak in a quick plug, um, you know, we're at the MES in Singapore, we've been working on something called Green Print for some years now. We started, I think, in the LISCO space with ES Genome. But today, at 5.15, if I heard Anton correct, um, we're going to be launching this new enhanced Green Print AI platform. And this time, Tim, we're looking at small and medium enterprises because they are the engine room, right, of our global economy. And they find disclosures seriously painful and difficult. And we're going to do things like have seamless disclosures, pre-fill data fields, you know, pull data from trusted sources, things like that. And we really, really, to your point, need to do more to make sure these platforms are all connected and interoperable globally. I think there's a great business case to be made for data uh, application and quality control, and I know Bloomberg and others are certainly in that case. Let me, let me come to you. I walked by your, the Ants uh, kiosk a few minutes ago. It's pretty impressive. It looks like you're trying to blend the world of technology and climate. Tell us what you're doing. Thank, thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, as you know, um, at Ant, we serve... Um, 1 billion users and over 1 billion users and uh, over 80 million um, merchants, and most of them are SMEs. So what we do really uh, can have a huge impact on addressing uh, climate change challenges. Um, so, so from uh, our perspective, we, we take it very seriously. Um, when we set our business strategy, uh, we set business strategy in conjunction with the formulation of our sustainability strategy so that our corporate mission is complete 
uh, as a coin with both sides and each side complement each other um, in our journey. Now on that journey, certainly sort of we, we constantly look at the ways uh, how we can work with public sector players and other uh, private sector players to make changes necessary for a sustainable world. Um, so I probably sort of, uh, you know, our, you, you would not be surprised that uh, how we take the approach in addressing those challenges is through technology. Um, and, uh, you know, later I will share some uh, cases uh, focusing on three areas, really. Uh, one is um, mindset, right, changing the mindset uh, to, um, by, you know, adopting a greener lifestyle. Um, and, uh, you know, I look at it here, I uh, look at a, a FinTech festival, ESG, we're very privileged, right? So what about the ordinary people? And uh, I think, you know, ESG, climate change, we need a grassroots movement, right? Um, everyone should be participating. How do, how do we do that? That's the first one. Second one is really uh, how do we improve the accessibility for SMEs in terms of green financing, right? Third one, obviously, uh, what technological innovation will help us uh, in our journey. So I can share that later uh, in detail. Ling, thank you. And both you and Diana raise an important issue, and that is the importance of a trust a, a, or a just transition that takes into consideration that a large portion of the world's population simply doesn't have the capacity uh, to make this transition. And I uh, recently I received a phone call from a minister of an African economy that said, hey, it's great for you to talk about transitioning to gas or nuclear or renewables. We simply, we have uh, plenty of oil. We want to use that oil to provide energy to our homes. We want what you have in the West, what you have in the advanced economies. You've got to remember the S in the ESG is not just the E, and I think that's important. Uh, Dana, I'm going to come back to you and then we'll cycle back through. You're a long-term investor. How do you think about technology investments in this space from a long-term perspective? Yeah, thank you. Um, um, from the investor perspective and, and linking that the intersection of sustainability and technology um, um, and how it can help advance that financing um, 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 towards a planet zero, I think um, they say data is a new oil and AI is a new energy, uh, but AI is just as good as the data we feed into it, right? So governance is extremely, extremely important. So having the right governance in place is important. So putting that aside, the three areas in which, um, from the investor perspective, I think technology and generative AI can help. One is that data component, right? The other one is uh, uh, measurability and traceability of impact which is what we're here after. We're not here about the rankings and the medals and the words. We're here about real world impact, moving the world forward in a just and inclusive way. And the third is about accelerating action. So let me elaborate on each one of them. I think we spoke a lot about data, but I'm giving another example. Climate stress testing scenario is one, this thing that financial institutions, we should do every year to ensure that our portfolio companies what is measure the impact of climate change in our portfolio companies, whether that's physical impact or transition impact and so on. There's a whole movement right now that is questioning whether we have the right models to accurately measure and price that risk. And if we are not underpricing that risk, given everything we're seeing in the world. If you see all the disclosures of financial institutions in TCFD, they say there's no material impact, question mark. Should can not technology and AI, can, can we get better data? Can we get better models? Can we get them quicker? So we are actually able to, again, move money where the money is and put the right adaptation, climate adaptation um, interventions in place, which will need money. The second point is traceability and measurability of impact. You all heard about greenwashing, right? So put in your money when your mouth is, being able to measure the impact of your money is extremely hard, back to data. I mean, through technologies like we're seeing these days, can we trace where our money is? What, what is the impact of our money? If you invest in a sustainable fund, do you, do you want to know where your money is going, right? We do as well. We do want to know. And when we develop those funds for you, we want to make sure that your money has the impact you're looking for. 
traceability, carbon offsets, the biodiversity credits, how can we increase the integrity of carbon offsets? How can we measure the additionality of carbon assets and biodiversity credits? It's traceability, it's measurability. Prove me that my offset is actually absorbing CO2 from the environment. It's, we're actually improving biodiversity, whatever I invest in. And the last piece is accelerated action. Smart cities, smart grids, um, automated vehicles, they all run with AI. Right? So if we have the right governance in place and we're able to deploy AI faster, those green technologies that will be people for the transition will come faster, cheaper, more affordable. We will have in projects where to invest. We love those projects. Um, but we need more of those to enable uh, African countries and many other countries to transition quicker in an affordable way. And last but not least, let's not forget about people's skills. Sustainable green skills. You're all here for a reason. You're interested in this topic. Many people out there are too, but they don't have access to the right skills. We can accelerate, reach more people fast and quicker to equip them with those skills so they are not victims, but protagonists of the transition. And I think if you're mentioning carbon offsets, I'm going to come back to that. We've spent the last three years trying to make that market work. Uh, I'm hopeful and I'm optimistic. We'll see. Jillian, I'm going to come to you. Uh, I'm going to come to the audience in just a moment as well. So get your questions ready and we'll have a roaming mic. Uh, MAS has been involved in uh, coal uh, phase outs. So tell, and you've done work with McKinsey as well on this. Tell us about your project and then I'll work my thanks, way down. Thanks, Tim. Now, um, I, I've said this to a few people, but I see some new faces in the audience. And some of you might be wondering, why is the MAS seemingly obsessed with coal, right? And, and there are really three reasons for that. Coal starts with C and the reasons start with C too. And it's because coal is critical, coal is challenging, and coal is costly. It's critical because um, if we don't do anything about the plants that you know, are in, South, um, in APEC, uh, they will exhaust about two thirds of our carbon budget to get to 1.5 degrees, two thirds, without doing anything else, okay? So they're critical. It's challenging because the scale is immense. 60% of our power in the region comes from, comes from coal, right? And you know, I think, uh, Dinah, you mentioned employment. It's so true. There are about 8.4 million people employed in the coal value chain globally. 80% of this sits in Asia. So it's a huge, huge issue for, for our region. Uh, and it's costly, right? We've worked out about 500 billion US dollars are needed uh, to decommission Asia's coal plants. So th this is the challenge that we have. So what are the solutions, right? I think broadly there are two. The first is blended finance, which Diana spoke about. S applying that to coal specifically, the IEA has done work that the weighted average cost of capital uh, for coal plant owners, if you take China out of the picture, right. is about 7%. If you can bring that down by three percentage points, there's a pathway to retire um, about a third of the global fleet of coal plants within the next 10 years. They can be retired or repurposed within 10 years. So it's, it's doable. Now the challenge is, all the challenges that Diana said just now about blended finance. It's a great concept, but it's not scaling. It's transaction by transaction, negotiated painfully and painstakingly, right? And that's just not going to work. If you ask me, the main problem about blended finance is the shortage of grant and concessional capital and the over-reliance of that as a mechanism in the blending. Right? So that brings me to the second solution that I want to put on the table today. And that's, thank you for setting that up nicely, Tim. It's carbon credits, right? So we at the MAS have been working on this for some time. We think that if you can generate high integrity carbon credits from the carbon and the emissions avoided by bringing forward the life of a plant, making it much shorter, retiring it early, we think if we can generate that, it'll be a great alternative revenue source and improve the economics of the deals, right? So that's the idea. Uh, and we're putting our money where the mouth is. In September, uh, together with McKinsey, we launched a paper uh, that sets out that approach, right? How you can use carbon credits to, to accelerate the retirement of these plants. We call these new class of credits, this new class of credits, transition credits, because it's about transitioning away from dirty fuel to cleaner energy options. Um, 
make no mistake, we don't think it's as easy as the MAS or you know, some other regulator just saying, transition credits, you heard it here first, and then it magically happens, right? That yeah. isn't, you've been working on it three years, that's quite scary, yeah. Uh, and the reality is the market needs a lot of work to get it, to get it done, right? So I, I think you know, there are integrity issues, we're gonna need market mechanisms to address the risks, there are demand issues that we need to think about, governments need to get behind this, uh, so, so many things, right? And I think technology, can provide the necessary infrastructure for that confidence building, right? Yeah, whether it's about data and so on. So just very quickly to finish up, what we're doing at this stage, our paper's out there, right? It was launched a couple of months ago. Please go read it. We are actually validating the, the concepts in the paper with real partners, right? We've put together a uh, transition credit coalition. We call it Traction. Uh, we've already got sort of 20, 30 members that are in, and it's been wonderful to see the support behind this. Uh, I won't say the names, because we're gonna talk about it at COP, but I can tell you that it really covers the full value chain. So carbon credit, you know, standards setters, we've got financial institutions, we've got, you know, uh, project developers, just transition experts, and so on. So that's one piece, the coalition. And the next thing we need to do very quickly is actually test the concept on a real pilot. So that's what we're working on. We've got something brewing somewhere in the region, and we hope to give you more details at COP. All right, I look forward to that. Uh, and, and obviously, it'll be fabulous, because everything you do is fabulous at the MAS. Christoph, I'm gonna come to you. We keep hearing the, the D word, that's data. Uh, you have a new score index that you put out uh, uh, recently. Can you tell us a little bit about the Swiss perspective on data? Indeed, uh, I think it has been rightly put that changing people's mind is actually what we need. We have seen with the implementation of the TCFD that people really started working on the issue. And also, TCFD as an early adopter, uh, we have uh, included the double materiality, but also three emission scopes in it. So our companies, which have a footprint globally, actually needed to think about how can we address also the mandatory transition financing issues. So people started thinking on how they can evolve. Secondly, also, the quality of data is constantly improving. It's not there yet. Right. So we really need to push them also to think further, and also comparability of data. The Net Zero Data Public Utility, which will be launched uh, uh, at the next COP, is certainly one further step in trying to test and foster the comparability across the jurisdictions. Um, this will help. We have also at product level in Switzerland, we have introduced the Swiss climate scores, um, um, giving an instrument to the companies in uh, following voluntarily in introducing metrics uh, uh, that they can show to the clients um, how they do apply the various emission scopes, but also how they do apply transition financing. The element that has uh, entice this is that they really do look into the issue. It is not mandatory, so they are free to choose, but they have and it gets slowly traction across the whole industry. Right. And ultimately, it will be the data quality that will uh, be paramount. And this is a huge opportunity actually for fintech providers, technology providers, like here in this uh, whole uh, premises here. And we have launched a fintech, a green fintech a network uh, in this autumn, and they are actually very active also in the green fintech space. Thank you. Ming, you, uh, Ant is the largest mobile uh, platform in the world. Maybe help us uh, talk a little bit about SMEs that keeps uh, coming up in our conversation. You have a window into that world. Sure. How is that a uh, part of the solution? And then I'm going to come to the audience as soon as you're finished. No, I think, uh, you know, uh, you touched upon mindset and, and the data. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, big corporations, green disclosure is relatively easy for them in the sense that uh, they have the resources to do it. But what about SMEs? Uh, how we work with them to reduce the burden, the cost of green data disclosure in that, and we're working with the MAS on some initiatives uh, to really help SMEs to do green, green disclosure um, and uh, in, uh, in China, we, um, we have a, a virtual bank called MyBank. 
and uh, we are leveraging technology to help SMEs uh, from a green rating perspective to really improve their accessibility uh, for, for green financing. And uh, through our uh, technology we, um, studies and research, we found that you know, the, the SMEs with the greener behavior actually have a lower default risk. Um, and in that end, uh, we work with them, improve them, their, their uh, accessibility to green financing. Uh, so some uh, fact data we have um, in 2022, uh, through that technology, my bank has um, uh, helped over 6 million SMEs uh, to do green uh, rating and uh, uh, supported the finance for over 400,000 uh, SMEs. Um, I mean, given the number of uh, uh, SMEs we, we serve, um, still small, but we start from a, uh, from a small and, uh, you know, the, the spirit of uh, uh, and is, um, you know, individually uh, we can do little, but together we can move mountains. Uh, so hopefully that will, uh, will have some positive changes. On the mindset side, we have for Ant Forest, yeah, which is embedded in Alipay and to encourage people to have, you know, the, the green um, uh, carbon, carbon, low carbon footprint is converted into uh, you know, lifestyle for them. And, uh, you know, grassroots movement is not about, you know, education uh, by taking lectures or things like that, but how you sort of consciously change your behavior on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, through working with the 600 partners um, uh, and uh, through the efforts of 6 million, 600, 6, 650 million users, uh, we have planted over 450 trees. Uh, so those are little things that we accumulate. Hopefully we can bring small and beautiful changes to the world. Those are amazing numbers. 650 million users and how many trees? 450 million trees planted million today. Trees. That's, that's phenomenal. Uh, folks, you've been incredibly patient with us. I'm happy to take uh, questions from the audience. There are roving mics, I'm told, from the organizers. I don't know where they are, but... Does anyone like to query this amazing, talented group of people? It, the, right here in front, thank you for doing that, right here in the front. Microphone right here. There we go. Thank you. I'm Nishta from Asian Investor. Uh, so uh, uh, there was an MSA conference I was attending a little while back, and there was a point raised that uh, while there's a lot of focus on uh, coal and energy, uh, food, uh, which has you know some low-hanging fruits, and uh, which uh, to get sustainability in that area might be easier. Uh, it's it's not getting the kind of traction and investment that it. Uh, the kind of impact it can generate. So would love to hear uh, what are the views, what's being done in that area. Sure, agriculture and land use is what, 20, 30% of emissions is quite large. Yeah, it's quite significant. Who, who, would, who would like to take on the food question? Um, Danica, there you go. So that's a very good question, precisely because it's all relevant for the economies in which we live, right? But all emerging and developing economies, as was previously said. Um, I think, um, in that particular area, the role of, of insurance and the love of um, a guarantees of blended finance could actually be very beneficial. I think the, the issue of this project sometimes is the bankability, whether they're financially bound for commercial capital. Um, so the other is also the size. And there's a whole th movement around whether um, um, the, 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 the insurance mechanisms has also a catalytic F, um, of factor of function with that place. Um, I think there are a lot of developments. I think it's a very, very important. It has tremendous impact across the 17 SDGs. Uh, it is one of those projects that is tremendously impact on how we can make it commercially viable. And I think their, their role also, I'll give you an example, of the, um, um, the food and beverage 
companies, the likes of Coca-Cola, and you name it, um, the role that they have as well in ensuring that their supply chains and making sure that they're also part of that process as well. And they as uptakers, what kind of guarantees they can get that actually the food that is going to be produced, there's going to be uptaken, there's a, there's a commercial element to it as well, right? But absolutely, it's a, it's a, it's a very important area um, and just deserves more attention, like you said. Just very quickly on, on agriculture, I mean, I absolutely agree. Someone recently brought some data to me that said, you know, what the impact of agriculture could be, right, in terms of emission savings, and it's massive as well. I think when we picked coal, it really stemmed from, you know, having limited resourcing, needing to deep dive and focus on what's most needle moving, so we went there. But as I said at the start, you know, we really need to look at this as a system sector by sector. And my team's actually working on that. We're looking at sort of, you know, prioritizing the highest impact sectors that make most sense, where the Singapore financial sector can be most needle moving and impactful. And, you know, we'll see where agriculture stacks up there. But regardless, right, this is a sector we need to prioritize for our sectoral pathways. And we need regional pathways for that. Great question and great answers. Other question from the audience, right back here. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Patricia from Bloomberg. Uh, my question is regarding the, um, the, the paper on managed, um, financing the managed um, phase out of coal power, power plants. Um, there's a lot of talk about using high integrity carbon credits. How, how, and I'm not sure whether this is already written in the paper, but for the benefit of those who also haven't read the paper. How do you define that? And, and for it to work, of course, you, you, you need buy-in from governments around the world, industry participants. So what's the, 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 the game plan to, to, to obtain all that buy-in for, for this to work? Yeah, thanks, Patricia. Um, yeah, I mean, I think just very broadly, without going into like overly technical details, which can get, you're absolutely right. What we will need is, is a few things, right? We'll need sort of ICVCM support. So we're working on getting that, you know, fingers crossed. If ICVCM is here, you know who's looking for you. Uh, and then I think we need robust methodologies, right? Because um, this is something that's new. There are challenges with carbon credits that need to be unlocked. So we want the methodologies to be super airtight and robust. There are a number of folks that are working on these methodologies, including, you know, the US and, and various other credible names, right? And, you know, we think we've found some methodologies that, that look right. What we need to do, as I mentioned earlier, is start to road test some of this on the pilots. So that's really, really key as well. Um, sorry, what was the second bit of that question? Um, I think you hit it. Yeah? And you might note that you have one of the leading exchanges in the world here in Singapore yes. in terms of carbon offsets. That's so right. you're a technology leader and they're tokenizing those assets. Sorry, as I got well. it now, Patricia. She also asked about governments, right? And what the role of governments uh, uh, is. And I think governments can play a massive role, as I sort of led into at the start. Right? If governments can scrutinize, and I really want it to be rigorous, right? scrutinize the methodologies, scrutinize the, the, the approach that we're putting forward, and say, hey, you know, provided this meets our own high you know, environmental integrity, we recognize these credits as good and valid, and you know, we can use them for NDCs, we can recognize them off you know, carbon tax offsets. I think that will be a huge demand signal for the, rest of the, um, for the rest of the market, which will include financial institutions, uh, real economy players, and so on. So it really needs to work as a system, but it starts and ends with integrity. Indeed, and you can use the offsets for new technologies, but also to protect nature-based carbon sinks, which we're losing the equivalent of the, the size of the country, the Netherlands, on an annual basis. And if we don't protect them, if we don't give a cost to that, those uh, carbon sinks are gonna go away. One last question. I've got one minute left right there in the middle. We'll get you a microphone. Right here in the middle. Keep your hand up so they can see you. Hi, I'm Gabrielle from Eco Business. Um, I have a question about, um, you know, the bankability of projects. I think that's something that a lot of the financial institutions have brought up, that there's a lack of bankable projects in this region for... Um, that's related to sustainability. And I wanted to ask if, you know, central banks and uh, the private sector and the public sector have come to an agreement about what uh, constitutes bankable projects. And um, 
you know, with all these finance, new financial mechanisms and structures coming up, um, will they sort of help to address some of those concerns? Thank you. Nani, you want to take this? <laughs> That's an excellent question. You touched exactly the neurologic point of sustainable finance. Um, how we come to an agreement with World Bankability is, I'm not aware that we have. How we stop trying? Not really. Every day. Um, and, 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 and governments do have a lot of role, a, a big role play in bankability of projects. Um, country risk, uh, continuity of the project due to permits, land use, you name it. Depends on the technology, it depends on the type of project that you, that you mentioned. Um, there is more to be done in that space. Um, I think um, the new, the new va I don't think it's a matter of coming up with new structures. It's just coming up with new projects that we can test and try and try and try again. I think one of the things that we say as an asset owner is they come to us when the deal is made and then need the long-term financing. And we always say, come to us when you're actually shaping the deal so we tell you what do we need to actually invest in this project for long-term. So I think it's, it's part of that conversation. Um, would there be a definition of one bank abilities? Country by country, bankability means different reasons. I mean, these are many things, it depends on the country, country risk and so on. But the mechanisms that need to be in place to actually come down to that agreement is to have more projects, to have more possible investor opportunities, and to get in that conversation earlier, not before they, you define the instrument, but before you even define the instrument. Yeah, I think there's enormous opportunity here. I think we'll see more of that in the future. Christoph Lehmann. Anna and Jillian, thank you so much. Please give them a round of applause and thank you for coming today.